Good evening. My name is Scott Bradley. I'm the executive director of your Thunder Bay Museum. Thank you for everyone who's joining us in person and on Zoom. And as I said, we are a sellout crowd. There are about 70 people in here tonight. So very excited to see you all out um, supporting um, our presenters this evening. I'd like to begin tonight by acknowledging the original custodians of this land, paying our respects to the elders, past, present, and future. So they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture, and the hopes of indigenous peoples. We also recognize that we are meeting on the traditional land of Fort William First Nation, signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850, and to acknowledge the role of the Métis settlement in the development of our community. So a bit of housekeeping. Um, there is a restroom just outside the door here on the right side before you get to the elevator. There are also restrooms down on the second floor and the first floor this evening. This lecture is being recorded. For those of you joining online, we cannot see you nor hear you. Uh, for those in the room, Please do silence any of your electronic devices, boom boxes, CD players, MP3, everything you got. Uh, there, there are refreshments, so if you get peckish, um, go out and fill up a plate and then make a mess at your at your um, at your seat. Now there is coffee and tea, and there's lots of food out there, so please do help yourself as we uh, as we get through the uh, the presentation. Um, there will be time for questions and answers afterwards, and so. Uh, tonight's lecture is sponsored by Lakehead University's Department of History, and I would also like to recognize some of our distinguished attendees for tonight's lecture. Um, please stand, give a wave, or give a whoop um, to be recognized, and if I miss anyone, I apologize. So, actually, I think my couple people have the list didn't make it tonight. So, okay. So, um, I don't think we have any board members here tonight, um, but I would like to uh, recognize some of the former board members that are in the room, so do give us a wave and a whoop if you're here. Where's Mark Chocolate? There he is. Okay. And, 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 if you are, and if you are a member of the society, let's let's see a show of hands if anyone's a member of the society this evening. A bunch of nervous people. Thank you very much. And also joining us this evening is War Bride Christine Moss, 100 years young. <laughs> So our first presentation this evening is by Taylor May Lawton, entitled Conscription at the Lakehead, Fort William and Port Arthur during the First World War. Taylor Lawton was born and raised in O'Connor Township near Kekebeka Falls, Ontario, and will be graduating with an MA in history from Lakehead University in the spring of 2024. That's going up. Hmm. Taylor also holds on an HBA in history and political science with a minor in English and a specialization in military history from Lakehead University. Taylor's current research focuses on the impact of the First World War and the wartime leadership of Sir Robert Borden on Fort William and Port Arthur. Please let's give Taylor a warm round of applause and welcome her to the lecture. Hello everyone, my name is Taylor, and today I'm going to talk about how conscription or mandatory military service impacted those in Fort William and Port Arthur during the First World War. So first I'm going to give a little bit of an overview on the literature that already exists on the topic. So the literature on the First World War is extremely abundant on the national level, as many notable scholars and authors recount the events of the First World War. However, when looking at a more local perspective, there's much less scholarship, leaving many areas unresearched. Thunder Bay and the First World War is one of the key works on the local level, and this work looks at um, how those in Fort William and Port Arthur were impacted and how they also impacted the war. So the pictured edition of Papers and Records was a special edition on the war, while Labor at the Lakehead looks at the labor movement in the area from 1900 to 1935. Thunder Bay from Rivalry to Unity um, gives an overview of the history in the area, while similarly, uh, North of Superior also details the history in the area and how the Twin Cities came to be. It's interesting to note that basically all of these works are, the, the authors are involved in either the museum or the Lakehead University History Department in some way. And I believe that this shows both the, nece the necessity of both museums and history departments in this type of local scholarship. So these works, along with others, serve as the basis when looking to understand the local experience of the First World War. However, there still remains many areas for further exploration. As I began to research the topic of conscription and focus in on this geographical region, 
I was pointed to a few works that covered the First World War on the local perspective in different areas. So the work of Jonathan F. Vance, titled Township at War, along with James Pizzoulas for All That We Have and Are, both look at local histories of the First World War in different areas, with Vance focusing on a small town in southern Ontario and Pizzoula looking at Regina. <clears throat> so these works, along with the local perspective on Thunder Bay, not only fill up the importance of local scholarship, but also help us to understand how events on a local level can often be seen as a microcosm for the country at large, especially in the context of the First World War in Canada. As my paper in the 2023 edition of Papers and Records notes, the First World War brought change all around the world, and the twin cities of Fort William and Fort Arthur were no exception to that change. The populations of the two cities were increasingly diverse as the First World War approached due to the railway stops, as well as the various settlement schemes brought on by the Canadian government. But the diverse population shaped the twin cities and also how the citizens experienced and reacted at various points throughout the war. While some citizens were highly supportive of the war effort, others were willing to go so far as flee to the United States to avoid being conscripted for overseas service. <laughs> Needless to say, the diverse population at the Lakehead held diverse reactions to the Canadian conscription crisis. Sir Robert Borden became Canada's eighth prime minister in 1911, defeating Sir Wilfrid Laurier's Liberals after an extended run of Liberal governance. Borden struggled to gain support from around the country and also had trouble securing representation from all areas when forming his caucus, specifically Quebec. The recessions prior to the war only added to the discontent that many Canadians felt with Borden, had towards Borden's government. After three years in power, Wilfrid Laurier was looking forward to an election year that he thought would be a sure Liberal victory. However, instead of an election year, Canada soon became a country at war when Britain declared war on Germany in the summer of 1914. When Britain declared war, Canada was automatically at war as well and was required to provide food, munitions, money, and manpower to the Allied cause. Canada was not prepared for war in 1914, as the Canadian Expeditionary Force did not yet exist, and the permanent force of Canadian soldiers consisted of under 4,000 at the time. Borden's Minister of Militia and Defence, Sir Sam Hughes, quickly became an important figure as he was required to lead and manage the Canadian war effort and quickly mobilize those required for overseas service. Despite the limited resources at the start of the war, Borden pledged to Canadians in August 1914 that Canadians could be called upon to defend their own country, but could not be forced to go beyond the borders of Canada, and he claimed the conscription would not be necessary. The war was only really expected to last a few months at this point, and with the outpouring of volunteers, conscription didn't seem necessary at all. After the news of the war first broke, those in Fort William and Fort Arthur were relatively supportive of the war. And the mayor of Fort William, Samuel C. Young, stood on the steps of the Times Journal building and urged all able-bodied men to come forward and support the war effort. So that's the picture we see here of the Times Journal building. <clears throat> Many of the local residents viewed their affiliation with the Crown with pride and supported the war effort due to their emotional or familial ties to Britain. British-born Canadians volunteered for service in the highest numbers due to their allegiance to the mother country, while Canadian-born citizens of British descent volunteered in slightly lower numbers as they likely felt a bit disconnected from Britain by this time. French Canadians volunteered in even lower numbers, likely due to the historical relations between France and Britain, as well as the disconnect they felt from the events in Europe. The 1913-14 recession may have actually worked in favor of the war effort, as many of those who were unemployed were keen volunteer for military service. 20% of all recruits came from those who were unemployed at the start of the war. Others volunteered due to their thirst for adventure, allegiance to the crown, family or social pressures, or other various personal reasons. These recruitment initiatives stayed strong well into 1916, as many were eager to either support the mother country or they noticed that the war wasn't going to end as quickly as many originally anticipated. After a number of costly battles in 1916, many officials and military planners did begin to worry about the issue of manpower. Borden felt strongly about supporting who, those who were already on the front lines and continued to authorize additional troops for overseas service. With a population of only 8 million at the time, the vast amount of troops being sent overseas was taking an immense toll on the Canadian home front. Recruitment began to slow, and by 1917, only about 4,000 people per month were volunteering for military service, and most of which were not volunteering for infantry, which was where those recruits were desperately needed. 
Recruitment initiatives were further un- undermined by the mismanaged and inefficient systems put in place by Sam Hughes that remained in effect after his dismissal in 1916. Instead of re- using recruits to fill gaps in existing battalions, he continued to create new battalions that were often broken up upon their arrival in Europe anyways. This took longer and was not a good use of their time or resources. The picture on the slide here shows some of the early recruits lined up on Port Arthur's waterfront in, in 1914. Despite the early repeated statements by Borden that conscription would not be implemented, by 1917, the need for more recruits had reached an all-time high. Pictured on the slide is a recruitment advertisement from the Port Arthur News Chronicle, which was the daily newspaper in Port Arthur at the time. This is from April 1917, and it's basically urging all citizens to come forward and support the war effort in any way that they can. Those at the Lakehead were relatively supportive of the war effort at large, and many took pay cuts or made other personal sacrifices for what they saw as the greater good. However, there was also a large segment of the population that was less supportive of the war effort due to the economic turmoil at the start of the war and the labor conditions throughout the war that left many on edge. The divides within the Twin Cities remained largely along ethnic lines and were further exasperated by issues of unemployment and shortages, among other issues of the war that were reaching the home front. Many in the two cities felt that the government had ignored them unless they could be used for their own purposes of the government, like war or the exportation and extraction of resources. As many felt that conscription was going to be implemented soon, tensions on the home front continued to grow as those involved in organized labor or the socialist movement um, were largely against conscription in the war effort, and those involved in the local media outlets or the Great War Veterans Association were highly supportive. So these groups were clashing at the time. Borden traveled to London in the early spring of 1917 to attend the Imperial War Conference. And here's where it became clear to him that Canada had to continue sending troops, not only to support those who were already on the front lines, but also to help create a distinct national identity for Canada and to continue supporting the Allied war effort. Borden was pleased with the success of the Canadian troops following the Battle of Vimy Ridge in April 1917, but the number of casualties from this battle further exasperated the need for more soldiers. Immediately following his return home in May 1917, he announced to Parliament that mandatory military service had become absolutely necessary and would be implemented. This piece of legislation would require all able-bodied men aged 20 to 45 who were not part of a vital industry to report for military service. It's important to note that at this point, um, citizens could apply for exemptions based on their work or personal or ethical reasons. While many were in favor of conscription, others were concerned about how it would impact small town workers who were already facing significant labor issues and unfavorable working conditions. The military services bill was introduced in June 1917 along with three other pieces of legislation that Borden introduced to allow for conscription as well as additional powers for his government. Along with the Military Services Act, Borden introduced the Income War Tax Act as well as the Military Voters Act and the Wartimes Election Act. The two election-related acts were extraordinary as they allowed soldiers overseas to vote, as well as women who had a family member who was serving or who had served or was currently serving in the First World War. So this was exceptional as women did not yet have the right to vote in Canada. After implementing conscription, Borden spoke with Sir Wilfrid Laurier about the possibility of political union to work together and potentially avoid a federal election. Unfortunately, Laurier did decline this offer. However, many other notable liberals did take up the offer and cross the aisle to join Borden's conservatives and form the union government. After Laurier declined the offer, a federal election was required and was scheduled for December 1917. Borden was able to use the support of those in favor of conscription, as well as the election-related acts he introduced to secure a sure election victory. The election was not only fought, fought bitterly on the federal level, but on the local level as well as the local Labour candidates faced off against the union candidates. James Dunbar and Albert Dennis were the local Labour candidates and the newspaper attacks on them were ruthless, claiming that they secretly wanted a German victory in the war. These two were up against Robert Magnon and Francis Kiefer as the Twin City Union representatives. The newspapers were constantly running ads in favour of the union candidates and specifically encouraging women to vote for them. This was because any woman who had the right to vote at the time was connected to the war in some way through someone in their life who was serving. Many worried about the early popularity that Dennis and Dunbar were able to achieve. However, the attacks on them worked and both Magnon and Kiefer won in landslide victories as did Borden's union party. 
The government set out exactly what Borden desired, as it not only solidified his decision to enact conscription earlier that year, but it also reaffirmed that the general population was still in support of his wartime leadership by the end of 1917. The loudest outcry following the implementation of conscription came from Kobe, and this unrest came to a head in March 1918 when a man was arrested for not carrying his exemption papers. Huge mobs took to the street, and Borden was forced to enact martial law to regain control of the situation. Following this turmoil, as well as the increased need for more soldiers, Borden cancelled all exemptions that were previously available under the Military Services Act. This impacted the home front immensely, as farmers and skilled workers were no longer exempt. This also impacted those who were against the war based on personal or ethical beliefs. Following the implementation of conscription at the Lakehead, it became evident that many of the residents in the area who were eligible for service had already volunteered. Many of those who hadn't volunteered were against mandatory military service for one reason or another. The organized labor and socialist populations were largely opposed to conscription, even if they had been supportive of the war at one time. So some prominent socialists like Frederick and Eliza Yuri were supportive of the war effort and even assisted in early recruitment efforts. However, after conscription was implemented, those socialists that were supportive of the war quickly moved to side with those who saw it as an imperialist war that was only hurting the working class. Not only was 1917 and 18 characterized by the conscription crisis as well as the 1917 election, but these years were also characterized by extreme labor unrest in the two cities as the working class showed their discontent with the labor conditions and wages. Ethnicity was one of the main factors that impacted the way one experienced the war and how they felt about conscription. Those from Austria and Germany were considered enemy aliens and were treated extremely poorly during the war years as they were deemed a threat to national security. The Finnish population in the Twin Cities was heavily involved in the socialist and labor movements and were also largely against conscription and the war effort. By May 1918, the unrest at the lake had, had reached such a point that the two mayors sought assistance from the federal government. The government appointed Charles H. Kahn to investigate the labor activities in the two cities, and in his report, he noted that he was appalled by the impact Ukrainian, Finnish, and Russian locals had on the local socialist and labor movement socialist organizations and labor movement. As a result of his investigation, a ban was placed on the activities of over 15 different socialist groups. Unsurprisingly, this did very little to actually ease the tensions that were occurring on the home front. While they these groups did continue to function in more discreet ways, many noted that the Finnish labor temple was very quiet at this time. Um, this actually was quite challenging for them as these groups were key in providing um, support and forcing change for workers throughout the war years and beyond. So these actions only furthered what many in the socialist organizations believed and that the war was further entrenching the world in capitalist ideology. To shift a little bit, the indigenous population located around Fort William also had a unique experience with the conscription crisis as the vast majority of eligible men had already voluntarily enlisted for service. So when the Military Services Act was implemented in 1917, there was one man on the Nipigon Reserve and two men on the Fort William Reserve who had not already voluntarily enlisted. As a result, the relationship between the Indigenous population and the conscription crisis was quite different than most other groups. In conclusion, the conscription crisis had a significant impact on Fort William and Port Arthur, and it's evident that on an individual level, one's ethnicity played a large factor in determining how they were impacted by the implementation of conscription. While it's often argued whether or not the turmoil that came along with conscription in Canada was worth it for the outcome, when examining the number of conscripts sent overseas in the fall of 1918, as well as the number of casualties from this period, it becomes clear that it was absolutely evident for the reinforcements to allow the Allies to reach the armistice in November 1918. The relationship between the Twin Cities and, the con and conscription, or the war at large, remains unique. While the two cities were quickly growing and developing into urban centers, which were traditionally in favor of the war and conscription, the resource-based nature of the economy at the Lakehead further complicated this notion. The Lakehead struggled through labor shortages for much of the war due to the high demand for labor as well as enlistment, and the large demand for exports to support the Allied countries through the war. The situation at the Lakehead adds a further layer of complexity when examining the local reactions towards conscription. While the war united many Canadians in newfound ways, it also exasperated existing tensions within the population. 
I will note that this presentation highlights some of the most profound reactions to the conscription crisis, and, there was, and it's important to realize that there was a very large segment of the population that was supportive of, the, of conscription and the war effort, and those were largely people of British descent. This is definitely a topic that can be further examined due to the complexity that lies on both sides of the conscription debate, especially in such a diverse area like the Lakehead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Taylor. Um, we're going to take a pause here. We need to do something a little technical to improve the experience for those joining us on Zoom. So, Taylor, if you don't mind taking the questions now, okay. will, we, will we work on that behind the scenes? Okay. Yes. Yeah, George Roman from the Thunder Bay Military Museum. Did you ever do the research on how many citizens from Port Arthur and Port William actually had to get conscripted into the First World War? I don't have the numbers on me right now, unfortunately, but that is definitely something very interesting to look into. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. The numbers are in the First World War. Yes. But I will. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> You have more copies than some day? <laughs> yeah, they're downstairs. <laughs> they're downstairs. <laughs> yes. You know what kind of laws they enacted, Borden, to ensure his election was successful? Yes. So the Wartimes Election Act, as well as the um, Mil Military Services Act, was the conscription one. And then the two election related acts, um, basically allowing women who had someone, a family member serving, so they would have that personal connection, wanting reinforcements to go and support those who were already on the front lines because they had a family member who was in the war or who had been. So they would have that personal connection and would be very inclined to vote for Gordon. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Oh, me? Yeah. Oh, me? Yeah. Sure there's someone behind me. No. <laughs> so regarding um, the ads in the paper about uh, deserters and, uh, you know, the maximum penalty of the law. Yeah. That effect, what were the penalties for people caught as deserters? My understanding was that they varied. Um, I, I I haven't seen, um, like, one set fine. Mm -hmm. I've seen, even, even with um, the bans that were placed on the socialist organizations, it seems that it was sometimes a bit arbitrary. Um, I don't know if anyone else knows for certain. It was just it was jail time in their pockets. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if there was like a standardized amount. Whatever the magistrate felt. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, what happened uh, following the war when the veterans came back? Was there anger about the lack of support that these groups had shown, or was it quickly forgotten about the war is over, let's move on? Or that is a very good question. My research kind of ends when when the war ends, okay. um, so I don't have the answer for that, but it's, that is absolutely something interesting to look into. One of your uh, uh, slides that you talked about are Yes. And they had a deadline for the party. Uh, so, was it easy to get a party then? Or like, in terms of an exemption from from being yeah. conscripted? Yeah. Um, so, earlier on, when conscriptions were allowed, it, it wasn't easy. I think they kind of made it difficult. I know that there was only certain um, bureaus set up to hear um, these cases for being exempt, and they were only open certain days a week and certain hours that's my understanding that they made it a little bit difficult um and and like they said they could be exempt for ethical beliefs or religious but i don't know if that was really the case very often i think it was more so um physical the people who were working or who ha who were physically unable to yeah exactly so or people that were in um those crucial industries that were needed to kind of um produce things for the war yeah Yep. Could you elaborate a little bit more on the indigenous reactions or experiences to conscription? Yeah, so I think in this area, at least, um, they they didn't necessarily have to interact with conscription to a large degree because the vast majority had already voluntarily enlisted for service. So they wouldn't have had that same experience or backlash because there wasn't a, a large segment of them that um, hadn't all already voluntarily enlisted. So they didn't necessarily have that um, large reaction. 
Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I, I may be mistaken. It may have been different during the First World War, but I thought that the indigenous uh, soldiers had to give up their, their status and become Canadian citizens and therefore lost in some respect when they returned. Do you know how that happened in the First World War? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have that information on me right now, but um, that does sound like something I've read in my research. Um, and it is important to note for sure. So that's a very good point to bring up. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, thank you, everyone. Okay. Our set of, second set of speakers tonight are Asia Meyer and Bronwyn Chesterfield presenting The Journey to a New Life, War Brides, Journey to the Lakehead. Asia Meyer is a Master of History student at Lakehead University. She was born and raised in Thunder Bay. After completing her master's, she plans to enter the Social Justice Master's Program at Lakehead University to combine her knowledge of history with her passion for creating a better community for all. Bronwyn Chesterfield is a major of history student at Lakehead University, and she is doing her master's project on reconnaissance during the Second World War following the 29th South Alberta Regiment. She has her Bachelor of Education and wants to be a teacher after she finishes her master's. Please let's give a, a warm round of applause to them both. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Bronwyn. And I'm Asia Mayer. And we're going to be talking about war brides in Northwestern Ontario. So imagine, you're a teenage girl, you've lived through a long war, faced hardships, rationing, and uncertainty. Life has been scary and difficult these past few years. Then these mysterious foreign young men come to your country. They are soldiers. The men come bearing gifts of chocolate, fruit, and cigarettes. They tell you adventurous stories of their homeland, take you to fun events like dances, and after years of hardship, their generosity and fun-loving spirit is refreshing. You fall in love but your family is unsure about these Canadian playboy soldiers. <laughs> well, you love their sense of adventure, their antics are worrisome for your parents. These boys love to party and they love to drink. Despite your parents' concerns, you continue your courtship. However, there is a war going on. Your new beau could be sent to battle or back to Canada at any moment. You decide to get married to proclaim your love to each other before the war pulls you apart. After the war, you pack up your belongings and leave your family and the only life you've ever known to venture to a brand new country across the ocean. You have given up everything for the love of your life. You arrive in Canada where you face new challenges and opportunities as you begin your new life here. That is what over 43,000 women experienced in their young adult years. These women are known as war brides. And we have a short video from 1944 which shows war brides coming to Canada.
life in the land of opportunity. To her new citizens, Canada extends the hearty hand of welcome. So who were the war brides? War brides were women who married servicemen from other countries. Uh, many of these women would return with their husbands to their home countries and begin a new life uh, in a place that they'd never been before. By the end of the war, there were 41,737 British war brides. There were over 2,000 war brides from the Netherlands and also night, uh, about 20,000 Canadian, uh, Canadian children who came over to Canada. A fun fact that we found while we were researching war brides was something called war grooms. This was basically the reverse. Usually no courtships to be as they were seen as quick and they were maybe months at a time time. Eventually the opinion of Canadians changed once the families realized their daughters were committed to their men. Uh, families started to invite them over to get dinner, engage in them in conversation, and started to accept them into their daughters' lives. While public eventually opened up the idea to these relationships, the governments were still hesitant. Governments feared that these women would be left unmarried in their relationship and become public charges. After the war, many Canadian soldiers actually returned home, abandoning their girlfriends and their children, leaving the women to become dependents on the welfare state. Now, the Canadian opinion. So some Canadians were suspicious of the character of the women that were coming over to Canada. This hesitation actually comes from years prior, when in 1920, the Canadian government attempted to bring over single British women as domestic servants. Although British women were typically viewed uh, by Canadians as ideal citizen, these lower class uh, single women were deemed not the right sort of women. The domestic servants would actually attempt to marry well-off Canadian women, essentially, uh, sorry, men. Essentially, they were seen as opportunists or trying to climb the social ladder to increase their own wealth. So Canadians feared that history might repeat itself with the war brides coming over. However, the difference between these domestic servants that came over in the 1920s and the war brides was that they were, the war brides were already married or engaged women. Well-off Canadian women did not have any issue with the incoming war brides as they did not see it as an impediment on their social status. To, co to combat the rumors uh, that questioned the morals of war brides, Canadian newspapers and magazines printed articles that assured the women back home that their sons and brothers had chosen very good, sub ups, uh, very good women as their brides. A Legion newspaper wrote that Canadian servicemen were the best immigration agents this country could have sent over to Britain. <laughs> Similarity to the, uh, similar to the opinion of European governments, the Canadian government worried that war brides may be abandoned with their children in Canada, causing them to become dependents on the state. Despite their concerns, the Canadian government favoured the Union specifically with British war brides. During this period, Canada had a focus on creating a national sense of unity and identity, so British war brides actually played a vital role in the development of community national identity. Uh, British war brides were also seen as complementary to this development because the Britain, Britain had similar um, organizations and characteristics to Canada. Their British descent also allowed for the, the maintain, uh, to maintain, allowed to maintain a strong political and cultural connection between Canada and Britain. British war brides were believed to be very well as educated and assumed to be excellent mo mothers to raise strong patriotic, uh, patriotic new generation of Canadians. As mentioned previously, the Canadian government was skeptical that these hasty marriages might result in women and their children being left unsupported in Canada. To combat this, couples had to fill out a form titled Permission to Marry. The application process included interviews of both the bride and groom. The process was much more intensive for the war bride, as she had to provide reference later letters which would prove her moral character and confirm she had no illegitimate children. In addition, the Immigration Act of 1919 required immigrants to undergo health inspections to ensure they were in good health. This was to prevent any strains on the Canadian welfare system. Sometimes this process was complicated as some brides were already pregnant. 
in these cases, the marriage was either quickly approved or the wedding date was backdated. There was little concern about making these adjustments to the paperwork as it was better than the alternative, having a single woman with child. This circumstance was always viewed as a lapse of morality on the woman's part and never the man's. In addition to, to confirming the woman's morality, health, and the absence of children, the application allowed the government to ensure that the men were not already married back home. Many Canadians were not truthful with their girlfriends, lying to them about their marital status. This ensured the Canadian men were not taking advantage of the girls, or the women did not arrive in Canada only to discover their husband was already married. Although they tried to prevent these instances, they did sometimes occur. Now, the war brides traveling over to Canada. We found this very interesting. Um, they, the British media called this mass immigration of women to Canada Operation Daddy, as the mass, <laughs> as the mass amount of children that were coming over with women was substantial. So that was one of the fun ways that the Br the Canadian media uh, talked about this immigration. Uh, yeah. Before setting sail, brides packed belongings that they deemed important and essential to their new lives in Canada, including any documents they needed, such as immigration papers, their health records, photographs, good luck tokens, and jewelry. One Dutch war bride brought only her finest clothing over to Canada. After having lived in occupied Holland, she believed Canada was the land of plenty and she wanted to look her best when she got here. The women were traveling all expenses paid to Canada by the Canadian military. So they also had so much uh, help at their disposal for immigrating over to Canada. A lot of the steps in their process were paid for and also assisted, they were assisted with it from the Canadian military. The war brides had two options for traveling over to Canada. The first was a luxury cruise line, such as the Queen Mary, but most of the war brides from Port Arthur and Fort William, uh, Fort William arrived on the Aquatina. Uh, Canadian officials wanted to ensure that the war bride's journey to Canada was enjoyable, especially if they were traveling with children. So the women were provided with lavish five course meals and canteens filled with goods and the best linens they could ever sleep in. <laughs> Brit uh, however, brides that did not have children or who opted to take a different means of transportation would normally go on soldier transport ships, also known as troop ships. Brides were given the best accommodations on board these ships. However, the troop ships were quite crowded and not as comfortable as the luxury liners. It would take approximately five days to reach Canada. Now, these are some newspaper articles that we found in the Port Arthur News Chronicle, and each of these uh, represents a war bride or announcing a war bride that is coming that week or expected to come. It says their name, also the address of where they are going to, to help encourage the people in Port Arthur to rally around these girls and accept them into the community. So it was a way of trying to gain morale within the community. So there are a few really interesting. Uh, I got a very big shock when I saw those pictures when I was scrolling through. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun <laughs> to look through. So when they arrived to Canada, brides arrived to Canada at Pier 21, which is the major immigration port in Halifax. Some brides remained on the ships for a full day before they were allowed to disembark and have uh, and meet a port officer with their immigration papers. Brides traveling on uh, soldier ships or troop ships were able to enter Canada more quickly as they were immediately able to disembark with the soldiers. Upon entering Pier 21's immigration facility, the war brides' travel uh, certificate documents were processed by Canadian officials and their documents were stamped as landed immigrant. Now this is important because contrary to the belief of many of the women, they were not citi uh, citizens of Canada when they first arrived. Many had to apply for Canadian citizenship, citizenship later on uh, because they were only documented as landed immigrant. Once they passed through immigration, they were greeted by Red Cross workers. The workers would help them with their children, offer the woman tea and pamphlets, providing information on their travel, uh, travels in Canadian life. From there, women were escorted to their trains where they would begin their journey to their final destination to meet their husbands and their new homes. 
War brides were unaware just how long their new adventures would take them. One war bride heading to northern Ontario said to the man next to her on the train, would you wake me up when we make it to Lake Superior? He laughed and explained that it would take at least 30 hours to reach there by train. As the train stopped at each desti destination and town, brides would say goodbye to their friends. One woman recalled waving to her childhood friend as she got off the train at White River. She went over the snowbank and she never saw her again. <laughs> For British war brides, preparation for life in Canada began before the women left Britain. Because most war brides were from Britain, the Canadian Wives Bureau was established to prepare British brides for their new lives as Canadian wives and mothers. Literature such as booklets and cookbooks, as well as movies, lectures, acti and activities were provided to the women at the War Bride Club at England. Female supervision of immigrating war brides through volunteer groups was prevalent. Female volunteers worked closely with war brides to insert, ensure supervision and protection of the women. Some women ran hostels for traveling women, met them at their train stations, and brought them home. They also ran education and cultural programs to make them good Canadians, as well as establish connections with other war brides. Associations such as the Canadian War Brides Association assisted in their travels. Pictured is some of the literature that was distributed to the women. On the top left is a pamphlet that provided war brides information on disembarking the ship when they arrived in Canada. It provided them with information on dining arrangements and travel by rail. The top right shows the cover of a 17-page pamphlet that answered commonly asked questions about the passage to Canada. The bottom left is a pamphlet that informed war brides upon their arrival they would be greeted by the Red Cross workers who would provide them with tea, watch their baby, and even help send a telegraph to their husband and family. The bottom right is a cookbook which was published by the Canadian government for war brides. The book described the differences in Canadian and British cooking. For example, the different names of food. Triacle is molasses and scrag of lamb is neck of lamb. It also goes through meal times, what is served at each meal, which dishes to use, and how to measure. The book prepared women for their roles and expectations. Despite all the promotional materials, in preparation, women were not always prepared for life in Canada, especially in remote northern Ontario. Once women reached their final destination, the war brides were expected to settle into life seamlessly. But life in Canada was not as glorious as their husbands always proclaimed it to be. Men often romanticize Canada, adding to the women's misconceptions. One man told his bride that it never rained in the summer in Canada. <laughs> These tales led to many arriving ill-prepared for the weather, especially in northwestern Ontario. Women who landed in northwestern Ontario had to quickly adapt to life in the north. One man recalled his mother, who was a war bride, had to learn how to gut deer, partridge, fish, moose, and rabbit. This would have been quite different from the foods she would have prepared back home in England. In addition to their new lifestyles, women were plagued with loneliness. In this new country, they only knew their husbands. Many women were left home all alone most days, and some families did not approve of their sons' hasty marriages. Their hostilities made brides feel lonely and unwelcome. This loneliness led to homesick, feelings of homesickness. To combat these feelings, women formed and joined war brides clubs, where they met other war brides. This allowed them to form friendships as well as learn skills that are traditionally taught by their mothers, such as housekeeping and knitting. The relationships formed by war brides lasted decades. In Thunder Bay, the Fort William War Brides Club existed, and in 2006, 18 of these women still got together regularly. After arriving in Canada, telegrams and letters were used to communicate with their families back home. Unless they were privileged enough to travel to Europe and visit their families, women did not hear the voices of their loved ones for nearly 20 years when telephones became the norm in 1960s. In recent years, Facebook and social media have been used by war brides to, and their children to connect and reconnect with family and friends. Some women were able to travel back home and see their families. Visiting home was always a bittersweet experience for them. They never knew if it was their last time seeing their families, as war brides did not often know what they were returning home to. Living an ocean apart, they lived different lives and lost connections with their hometowns. Family members passed and dynamics had changed. And we have a story of a local war bride. Her name is Hendrike Sheffers Merkley. 
Merkley grew up in Holland and she described her home country as horrible and filled with sadness and fear after the Germans invaded in May 1940. In the spring of 1945, Holland was liberated by Canadians and Merkley described the men as a beautiful sight. Mm -hmm. Canadian soldiers befriended the Dutch and hosted events such as dances. Merkley said that the Dutch had not experienced fun for a long time. On June 25, 1945, Merkley met Ken, a kind and handsome man. They married on October 27 with the Canadian Army's permission. Ken was pulled out of her town in November 1945, and Merkley left Can for Canada in August 1946, leaving months between seeing her new husband. When she arrived in Halifax, she said goodbye to her friends from Holland, who were staying in southern Ontario as she headed up to northern Ontario. Merkley spent three days on a train, and she said the food and care were excellent. When she arrived in Port Arthur, her husband was waiting for her at the train station, despite the train being four hours late. She was welcomed by his family with sandwiches and cakes. Her husband built their fo first home in 1947. They had a daughter and two sons, and in 1948, her parents and younger sister immigrated to Canada. She also noted that she had her first hot dog in Canada, and she was very excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back at her time, Merkley stated she loves Canada, and she's very glad she came to this country. Unfortunately, not every woman's experience is a fairy tale like Markley's. Um, some marriages did not last, and this was due to a number of different reasons. The first being they were widowed. Many of the war brides uh, would meet their husbands, spe uh, specifically in England before D-Day. After they were married or engaged, the Canadian soldier would then be sent to the front lines. If their husbands did not survive, they were considered dependents to the soldier, giving them the opportunity to immigrate to Canada free of charge. There were some women who made the pilgrimage over out of duty and pledged to meet his family. It is estimated that between 400 to 500 women were war widows after the Second World War. The second was divorce. The hasty marriages meant that the women did not know who they were truly marrying. Homesickness was, homesickness was also a cause of divorce, as many ended up missing their families too much and wanted to go home. Unfortunately for these brides, they did not know if they were going to be facing hostility when they arrived to their new country, whether that be from their in-laws or from other Canadians who looked down upon them. As said before, many of the in-laws did not approve of their son's marriages to a girl that they did not approve of. Like European parents, they did, not, uh, they did not like the short courtships that had occurred. As many of the newlywed couples were moving in from, uh, with their new in-laws, there was a power struggle that would occur within the home. Many mothers did not allow their daughter-in-laws to have any say whatsoever in the way the household was run. As the war brides were still teenagers, some of them themselves, when they were moving in, their in-laws treated them as if they were children, not married women. This caused fights between couples as the husbands would often side with their mothers and not, <laughs> and not support their wife, uh, thus causing a divorce or a very unhappy marriage. The main reason women would get divorced, though, was due to their husband's behavior. Young women would follow who they thought to be they were in love with uh, to Canada. When they arrived at the train station, they would be waiting for their husband to greet them. However, for some women, their man never came. For, reasons on, uh, reason, for various reasons, sometimes they, it was due to the fact that they were already married in Canada or that they simply changed their minds. Husbands were also abusive to their wives, whether this, uh, the cause be regret or PTSD from their time in the war. PTSD was a major cause for divorce and women did not know how to help their husbands. Many of the husbands started to abuse substances as coping mechanisms for their PTSD, um, thus starting to uh, causing them to abuse uh, their wives out of anger or their children even of anger. PTSD was not recognized until, 19, until the 1980s, so many of the women did not know that their husbands were exhibiting this behavior because of the gruesome experiences they had at war. So these are some of the um, grim realities that I found when I was looking through the uh, Port, Port Arthur um, Chronicle News. 
Um, so the first one um, is, for instance, uh, the first one on my on my uh, right here, or my left, your, your right, is the story of Mrs. Elizabeth Morris, who arrived in Canada and had to immediately rush to her dying husband's side. This is so she uh, this was a reality for many of the Canadian war brides faced the possibility that their husband might not make it or even survive to the end of the war. It was a gamble if they'd even be able to experience their married life. And then on the far left is another on the on my far right, your left um, is an example of an article I found from the Port Arthur News Chronicle again. And this one talks about the war brides who were leaving, going back to, uh, to Britain from where they were from. And I'm going to quote from the article saying, uh, it put it really well. Many of the British girls have already gone back to the United Kingdom because of marital troubles, and others are awaiting passage. A soldier or an airman marrying overseas had the opportunity to know the girl and her family background, but the English girls had no way of knowing what they were coming to. So we have talked about the war brides and their lives. This is just a small portion of their lives and legacies. They were war brides, but they were also daughters, sisters, factory workers, nurses, members of the armed forces, mothers, immigrants, survivors, women. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you both. Uh, are you ready to take questions? Yes, we can take okay, questions. Okay, let's do that. <clears throat> yeah. It was noted that many of the war brides were from Holland or UK. Um, were there other countries that had a large number of war brides? So specifically for Canada, there weren't many as Canada only really fought in the European side. We did find a few examples, I think, of Japan. Yeah, there was Japan, Scotland, and Ireland were also some other ones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for the war groups, were they faced with a similar process as the war brides? Um, I don't believe it was as, as st strenuous as the war brides. Um, if, from what I remember correctly, it was um, they had less of a process of health regulations, but they still had to go through the process to make sure they weren't married. <laughs> yeah, Tom, yeah. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, in terms of um, war brides' comments on life in Canada and how it may or may not have differed from what their spouses told them. Uh, what were some of the other, uh, I mean, because of course you don't have time for all of them, but what were some of the best or funniest or most like touching uh, anecdotes that you found in, in your research? Um, you did more of that one reading. Yeah. Uh, the hot dog, a lot yeah. of them commented on the food, um, the differences in the food. Um, the beautiful landscape, too. Um, there was one woman, she was traveling by train to Lake Superior, and she looked out the window the whole time, she said. She was very excited about that. There was also the example of the prairies. Uh, if they were going to the prairies, they didn't expect, expect it to be as flat as it was. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Uh, maybe I misunderstood. Were they sending some of the war brides over like during the war? Mm -hmm. So they, yes, they did actually. They sent only a few because they were afraid of en enemy ship, oh, the ships being uh, sunk. So, but a lot of times they traveled after the war. Okay, but there was some going over. Because there were a yeah. few, yeah. Yeah, 1944 they started and 1947 was like the big year. They came mostly after the 46. soldiers returned home. Oh, 46, sorry. Yeah, because during the war seems surprising, right? Or, yeah. Like, you would think if the husband did die, you, there'd be more support, you know, in England for them than over here. So it mm -hmm. strikes me as odd to send them during the war. Yeah. It's that they started in 1944, so... I think it was their choice if they wanted to go over to Canada and start their life there at all, so... Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Question? Yes? Yeah? Uh, just following up with the gentleman over here, my mother was a war bride from the Netherlands, and one of the things that she shared was, like you had mentioned, that 
they were sort of lively spirits and um, you know shared their chocolates and things but my mother said that the Canadian soldiers were well fed mm -hmm. and they kept her family alive mm -hmm. like and oh. out of gratitude she married my dad like, <laughs> like really when someone's saving your life like that that was the you know the level of gratitude people felt so <laughs> Yeah, having looked at the Netherlands for my project specifically, they, it's very much, that's the story I hear a lot, is the Canadians really did try and help feed anyone that they could whenever they were going through the Netherlands, because my research follows the specific regiment that went into Holland. Okay. So, yeah, done some reading on that. Yeah. Yes. Hi, so my mom was a war bride too, and she was from Denmark, so, and my dad was a British soldier. And uh, one of the things that she said, it was very, it was much like that. It, they came over and it was very, they had a great time and stuff like that. But one of the things she always said, they, she came in 1948, and the rule sort of then was that you had one month to be married. Mm -hmm. So she arrived on April the 14th. And if you weren't married within that month, you had to go back. Oh, so they gosh. quickly planned a wedding and were married on May the 14th so she could stay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know about that rule, but I know a few uh, women came over as engaged instead of actually married. So, yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, so she came over by boat and then by train from Halifax to Toronto. That's where my dad was at the time. So, wow. yeah. My mother was a war bride from Ireland, mm -hmm. and um, you mentioned that there was a war brides group uh, in Fort William, mm -hmm. and um, I don't know if she was part of that group, but she had a very close group of friends that support. They were mostly from Ireland, and a couple of them unfortunately did go back for various reasons, but uh, <laughs> one of the stories that I want to share. My father was Italian-Canadian, he was very dark-haired, dark-eyed, and whatnot. My mother never knew he was of Italian background until she got here. <laughs> she was met by, you know, all the Italians. Anyway, her, her idea was, they, their belief was that everybody in Canada was either French or English. So she assumed he was French. Because yeah. <laughs> he never called it. <laughs> Did she consider that a step up or a step down? <laughs> <laughs> she considered it a big surprise, but she just accepted it. <laughs> you know, but, but, it, it, but I remember her group of friends, they, they were friends, lifelong friends, forever yeah. and ever. They just support and I'm, I'm sure those friends got her through, as well as her own family. Stuff, right? Yeah, a lot of the War Brides groups are still active throughout Canada. Even the children have joined and continue to share those relationships. Yeah. Do you know if we have any active War Bride uh, like member groups actively like in Thunder Bay at the moment? We've looked and we could not find anything except for a news article in 2006. That was the last record of them being around. Uh, you mentioned my. There's a woman that was mentioned, yes. uh, Siegfried Corey. That was my mother's best, best friend throughout her lifetime. Oh, oh. oh. Thunder oh. Baby. But her sister's still alive, and oh. yeah, she's a war bride. Wow! Oh, wow! And, and yeah, she lives locally. That's amazing. We do have a war bride here at the very yes. front, Chris yes. Moss. Yeah. Who <laughs> came to Canada first to Cornwall, I think, Chris, and then. I don't know if Chris can hear, can she? No, no. <laughs> but Chris was a war bird, yeah. Yeah. When you did your research, did you do oral interviews as well as uh, searching newspapers and so on? No, no, not at that time. We did not. No, but I'm continuing the project to look further on war brides because as we were looking, there's a huge gap in research on this area specifically, but there's a lot of war brides and their children still alive who want to tell their story. So I'm going to be pursuing that as my research for my master's project. It's a great oral uh, project. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, 
they seemed very well prepared with documentation for these uh, women coming over. Was was there any uh, was it, was that partially because of the World War One experience? Was it war brides coming over then, and they could learn from that experience and apply it to World War Two, or is it they just whipped them up when they found out? Oh, we better do something. <laughs> so in World War One, there weren't as many war brides as there were in World War Two. There were some, but it wasn't as prevalent as it was during the Second World War. They did not have as many documentations or. Um, rules in place at the very beginning of the war when these men were originally marrying these women. So the military basically went, oh, we need to do something. This is happening. So they started putting more implementations in by the 1940s, 1941? Mm -hmm. I think it was, 19, it was the 1940 and 1941, I believe. So, yeah. The previous speaker was talking about natives and how often, how many uh, went without being conscripted. Uh, what about war brides coming back for native soldiers? You found the story. Yeah, there was, I know locally there was a war bride who married an indigenous man. Um, I'm not sure of their names, but I've just heard about that through someone telling me a story with their connection to them. Um, and then I believe it might have been in Scriber. Um, there was another indigenous man who brought back a war bride as well. But those stories aren't recorded very well. Any other questions? Uh, that's evident. There are a lot of people here with uh, war bride parents and so on that have direct connections in this room. And you're continuing your studies, evidently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so how would we uh, share our information with you? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I can give everyone who would be interested in being interviewed, I can give them my email or get your contact at the end. That would be amazing. I would love to hear your guys' stories. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> and, to, and to add to that, if you don't get connected tonight, email email the museum and we'll make those connections as well to help out. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah, Danielle. Roman, just pass out my email and I can pass them on. There we go. Well, perfect. You can have your business card on. I will run downstairs and get some. <laughs> <laughs> Is that it for questions? Go on once, twice? Okay. First of all, thank you to all three of our presenters. We have a little gift from the museum, so you each get a nice commemorative pen. And then, of course, uh, of course, there's also a sticker available in the gift shop. Um, so, um, with with that in mind, uh, you know, I'm the one keeping you between the coffee and the food. So, I'll be brief. Um, so on your way out, please do visit our gift shop. If you are not already a member, because I looked down the list of everybody registered, there's lots that aren't members. So if you're interested, uh, please do uh, think about signing up for a membership. You can do that at the front desk on your way out. You can do that online. You can give me a call. We'll figure it out. <laughs> so um, do look at our upcoming events calendar as well. On the 27th of February, uh, Alan Campbell will be presenting about his career in the logging industry and, and his uh, career in healthcare in the northwestern Ontario. So that should be a pretty fascinating one. That goes all the way back to the horse-drawn um, days. On the 12th of February, the museum, in partnership with the Thunder Bay branch of the Canadian International Council, is hosting a presentation by Kim Richard Nossel titled, All Alone in the World. What a return to, or what a return of America first would mean for Canada. So it should be, um, if you like existential dread, that should be a good presentation to come to. Um, so again, that's 12th of February. Um, it's part of his uh, book promotion tour, so uh, that should be a fun one. Uh, also keep it out for our announcements on March break camp. Those are coming soon, so get your kids signed up early and often. And then uh, the Society's annual general meeting will be on Tuesday, 26th of March, immediately followed by our biennial publications awards ceremony. So do come up for that. And then, of course, our annual fundraising event, the Taste of History, will be on Friday, 5 April. Tickets are on sale now, with the theme is the 100th anniversary of the Royal Canadian Air Force. So... Thank you to the Lakehead University's Department of History for sponsoring tonight's event, and thank you to all the museum staff who put so much work into making tonight happen. Please do take advantage of the refreshments, and please, 
all of you um, are, you know, uh, pleasantly invested in tonight's topics, please do take the time to talk to each other, enjoy each other's company, and of course, eat all the food that's out there. So have a great rest of your night. Thank you. <laughs>